Cuba. All right, cool. That's awesome. Um, I think we're just about good to get started. All right, so we are thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Seminar series dedicated to the research and academic quantum communities. This seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and is hosted on our Kiss Kit YouTube channel right here. And I'm your host for today. My name is Olivia Lanes from IBM Quantum, and I'm very excited to be able to be here today and to be speaking with Dr. Charles Brown. So a little bit about Charles. Dr. Charles Brown is experimental quantum physicist, science communicator, and champion for Black Americans in STEM. Charles earned his BS with honors in physics at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and his PhD in physics at Yale University. He is now a postdoctoral scholar and Ford Foundation Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. At Berkeley, he is a member of the ultra-cold atomic physics group where he investigates ultra-cold atoms trapped in optical aliases, which offers an avenue to study a rich variety of many-body quantum physics phenomena. Charles has a history of both empowering students spanning the elementary through graduate levels in pursuit of their STEM interests and advocating for their inclusion and retention, which is just awesome. So Charles, I'm really, really happy to have you here today and to listen to your talk on non-equilibrium phenomena of ultra-cold quantum gases trapped in optical lattice potentials. How's it going today, Charles? Uh, it's going great. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, we're super happy to have you. So um, just as a reminder, Charles is going to take over and bring up his slides here in just one minute. And P please feel free to ask questions throughout the talk and I'll do my very best to interrupt politely and to monitor the chat and ask those questions if you have any and probably ask them of my own as well. So let's just pull up your slides here and um, we'll get started. I'm just gonna mute myself, but I'm gonna unmute myself um, when we have questions. So take it away, Charles. Awesome. Okay, uh, well, yeah, thank you again for inviting me. Very uh, happy to be a part of this really great uh, seminar series that you all put together. Um, as Olivia said, I'll tell you today about uh, the recent work in uh, Dan Sanford Kern's group, um, where we study different non equilibrium phenomena using our uh, rubidium Bose Einstein condensates in different kinds of optical lattices. Um, again, I'm Charles Brown, and so I'll lead you through um, the different experiments I've been working on lately. Um, I'm also gonna start with uh, uh, different kinds of background on these topics. I think some people in the audience will see this as like a very uh, basic refresher, um, but I wanted to make sure that everybody has a sort of common uh, set of working information so that the salient points that I really wanna hit home do, the, do just that, they, they hit home. Um, so first, I wanna mention lattices. Uh, generally, uh, a lattice is a periodic set of points that has some set of symmetries. So I have a few types of lattices here that I'll show you. I start with the square lattice. The square lattice looks like this, what you see on the screen. Um, it has uh, translation symmetry, for one. Um, another thing that you can see is that it has a fourfold rotation symmetry. Uh, so if I just rotate the square lattice by 90 degrees, it's the same square lattice. Here's a, a segment of a triangular lattice. Again, it has a sort of translation symmetry, uh, but the rotation symmetry is different. So I can rotate this by 60 degrees and it's the same lattice. And also highlight the Kagame lattice, which is a, a lattice special to our, that we're particularly fond of in the Stanford Kern group. Uh, and this lattice, uh, it exhibits something called frustration, and I'll say what that means, but it's a very special phenomenon that exists in certain kinds of lattices. The Kagame lattice looks like this, so again, it has some sort of translation symmetry, um, but it also, and it also has the same rotation symmetry as uh, the triangle lattice, but it also has some other interesting properties, and like I said, I'll, I'll get into it. Um, I also want to mention band structure, and I'm going to sort of hit on this topic in a couple different ways throughout this talk. Um, here's an example of a one-dimensional lattice's band structure. So uh, lattices have band structure, and I'll get more into that, uh, but you can compare uh, the kinetic energy of a particle inside and outside of a lattice to sort of see this uh, qualitative difference between atoms uh, or particles inside and outside of a lattice. So here on the left, I have a picture of the kinetic energy of particles uh, versus their in-lattice momentum for a lattice that uh, is sort of 
as weak as possible. So basically the lattice is not there. And so what you see is that the energy, the vertical axis as a function of momentum, the horizontal axis, it varies quadratically like you would expect. This is, uh, you know, P squared over 2M kinetic energy. And so uh, you see these parabolic features that show you the normal um, relationship between energy and momentum that we expect outside of the lattice. However, when you uh, turn up the lattice, when you actually provide confinement of your particles via the lattice, what happens is you open up these gaps between these curves at certain, uh, over certain energy ranges. Now, this is a band gap, and um, I'll say a bit, bit more about this. Um, great. So um, the main point here that I wanted to say on this slide is that a solid's band structure describes the allowable energy levels for in solid crystalline materials, electrons in the lattice. And band structure explains a whole set of material properties, but I wanted to uh, highlight these. Um, the electrical resistivity, different Hall effects, uh, like normal Hall effect, the spin Hall effect, anomalous Hall effect, uh, optical absorption. And so that might be one that uh, some people are very familiar with from like solar cells, right? Solar cells have some band gap. They absorb at their band gap. I think a lot of solar cell people try to make the band gap of their cells sort of peaked around the peak distribution of the sun, that kind of thing. Uh, orbital magnetism, magnetism associated with motion of particles instead of their intrinsic uh, angular momentum, their spin, um, or topological insulators. Okay. And so when I was uh, mentioning the properties uh, for this qualitative difference between particles in a lattice that basically doesn't there, so basically a free particle versus a particle in the lattice, uh, I hadn't yet mentioned a particular way that you describe the, the wave function of the particles. Uh, and so the interesting thing or a useful tool about uh, that we use to describe particles in a lattice is something called a block wave function. So this wave function is the, uh, the object that carries information about physical observables uh, of the particles in the lattice. Uh, they take this form, there's some function that's periodic, it has the periodicity of the lattice, this U, and there's some phase that the particles accumulate as they move from lattice side to lattice side. Uh, also know that these U's are, again, I, I just said, but they are periodic. So if you look at this function U at some position in the lattice and you translate uh, and you look at it, um, you look at a position in the lattice that is that initial position plus some lattice vector R away. Um, a lattice vector is a vector that describes the periodicity. Uh, then you should have these functions be equal. Right? So these are these are two very important concepts that we use for describing the properties of these uh, lattices. Okay. So now I want to get into we you know I told you about lattices. This is a talk all about different effects with lattices. I want to tell you about the first topic I want to discuss, and that is the presence of geometric frustration in our cognitive lattice systems. system. Okay, and so what I want to say here, this is the main takeaway, our frustration is the conflicting interatomic forces that make unclear the lowest energy state of a system of particles. Uh, a nice example of this is thinking about a, a small system, a system of three spins, um, something you might call magnetic frustration. So here I have a, uh, an equilateral triangle, and I can put different spins on different points of this triangle, only on the uh, vertices, though. So imagine I have a spin up here. Uh, this spin is this particle that can only be up or down, as many of us know. Um, if I put a spin down at this other location, the question is, uh, should this spin be, should the spin at the top of the triangle be up or down in order to minimize the energy of the system? If the spin is up at the top, then um, the bottom left spin and the top left spin, they're both pointing up. This is a higher energy interaction. Or if I put the top spin to be pinned, spin down, then the top spin and the bottom right spin 
are pointing on the same direction. This is a higher energy uh, interaction. And so what is the lowest energy state of the system? It's hard to answer that question. There's a degeneracy here. There's another kind of uh, frustration associated with uh, not the intrinsic angular momentum, the spin, but at your different lattice sites, what is the sort of um, the emotional states that you are interested in, uh, the emotional states of the atoms at the different lattice sites. So here's a picture of a cubic lattice where um, at each point here, 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 et cetera, um, where the particles would be, you can have some spin or uh, some orbital angular momentum uh, that could also um, become frustrating. Okay, and so what's our goal in this work? It's to study the physics of orbital frustration. We're not looking at magnetic frustration, although you can learn some stuff about the other. Um, and we wanna learn how it leads to exotic states of matter. And so uh, we do this by creating a Bose-Einstein condensate in the lab, and we put it in the lattice, um, in a lattice that causes orbital frustration. Um, there are a couple lattices that are highly frustrated. Uh, they lead to some large degeneracy of what appears as the lowest energy, um, mo uh, kinetic energy states or energy states of the system. Uh, two that are particularly interesting are the Lieb lattice and the Kagome lattice. Uh, so the Lieb lattice looks like this. It's some sort of square lattice that has uh, different lattice sites that are labeled A, B, and C, and particles can hop uh, at some rate J from uh, site to site. This is, uh, this is one lattice that is frustrated. And there's some uh, interesting work uh, cited here uh, using the Lieb lattice to study um, uh, similar, similar physics to what I'm gonna, gonna talk about today. And in particular, I'll point out that in this paper here, uh, the authors see how the energy bands are distorted in the Lieb lattice by interactions. Okay. Um, we are going to, today I'm going to tell you about the Kagame lattice. Uh, this picture here, uh, it has a different set of symmetries, but at the end of the day, it's still some lattice that has some sites. It has some set of symmetry, some, some translation symmetry, some rotation symmetry. And it can be described by uh, particles hopping around from site to site at some rate j. Uh, now these lattices ha have a band structure with different interesting features. Um, for one, there are Dirac points, which is what I'm I'll actually talk about this in the second part of my talk. Uh, these are Dirac, uh, Dirac point is a point in this energy landscape where the um, uh, available energy levels become degenerate, de degenerate uh, so they become equal. Uh, but the way that these energy bands approach each other uh, is interesting. There are these other regions. Uh, and so, yeah, these direct points are here and here around this structure of band, of band structure. Um, and this is for the Lieb lattice. There are these other points, these triangles that are called Van Hove singularities, where the, the density of states uh, grows to some huge number at these locations. And then there are uh, sort of the main interests of this part of my talk, these whole bands uh, where the, um, the change in the, the energy of that band with the particles in lattice momentum is flat. This is a flat energy band where the, uh, all the particles have the same energy, sort of regardless of in lattice momentum. Okay, uh, this is a similar picture of band structure, but this is for the Kagame lattice. And so we're gonna be looking at band structure that looks so something like this. And before I move on, I wanna hit on the point that this all gets to this interesting question that theorists in the field have been wondering for a long time. And that is, um, what happens if you load a Bose-Einstein condensate, which we think of as being some collection of atoms that are in their lowest kinetic energy state into an energy band that is flat, where it's not clear whether condensation into the lowest state can happen, because since the band is flat, there's, how do you define low? What, what is low? 
this is this is an effort to to experimentally learn about the answer to this question. Okay, so what's our source of frustration? Um, I mentioned it's the cogmolitis, and we're going to be looking at orbital geometric frustration in the cogmolitis. So when I say orbital, I'm talking about atomic motion. I'm talking about uh, uh, the kinetic energy of atoms in my lattice. When I mention geometric frustration, I'm talking about some large, some huge number of uh, ground states, lowest energy states, a large degeneracy. Okay. And so, as I mentioned in the previous slide, I showed you a, a three dimensional image of uh, the band structure. But let me just show you this one dimensional plot. Uh, I'm showing you again the energy of these bands and some units. It's, it's not important for what I'm saying here as a function of uh, lattice momentum. Uh, these are some special lattice momenta, but just know that this is momentum. We see a series of bands. Uh, this is the first band, this is the second band, this is the third band, this is the fourth band. And we see here that there is a band that is flat. Again, so this is uh, in lattice energy being dispersionless, flat as a function of uh, momentum. And this is what we're interested in. This is how we're going to study frustration. And so here's our Kagome lattice. Uh, it's the blue points, and there's all sorts of interesting physics that you can study in the Kagome lattice outside of what I'm going to talk about today. One thing that I think is particularly interesting is these sort of uh, these extended states that extend over different uh, unit cells of the lattice, where if you look from, if you look around these hexagons, these connected hexagons, the phase of the wave function that describes the atoms alternates. And so you can connect uh, velocity to the gradient of the phase. And so you can have these large extended regions of this cogomy lattice where you see these, you see this like circular flow, sort of vortices or vorticity lattice. This is something I think is really cool from my background in superfluid helium. Um, but yeah, the, the cogomy lattice is a very rich, uh, I guess, landscape to study physics. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, so I think many of us are very familiar with this, but I wanted to make sure this is clear for us. Uh, I wanted to talk about the difference between bosons and fermions. And it's easy to, it's most easy, I think, to do that by talking about um, how they behave if they're trapped in a harmonic oscillator potential. Okay. So harmonic oscillator potential uh, has these different energy levels uh, that are uh, denoted by these different ends here. And even at the lowest temperature allowed by physics, Bosons are happy to all be in the same lowest energy state in whatever is trapping them. And fermions are not. Fermions will stack up across these different energy because of quality exclusion. Um, in our experiment, we use um, rubidium-87, the boson, to make uh, BECs. That's what we're using. So Charles, what is can you comment for a second on why you use this atom in particular? Can you say that one more time? I had a bit of an echo. Sorry, could you just comment for a second on why that atom in particular is the one that you guys are using in the lab? Uh, yeah, so rubidium is nice because it has a single valence electron. The whole column on the uh, periodic table does. And that means that its electronic um, energy level structure is sort of uh, relatively simple. It's hydrogen-like. So there's a nice um, a spread of uh, energy levels that uh, we have access to that we can address optically. And so that makes it uh, simpler compared to some two valence electron atoms, for example, to do things like uh, cooling, um, to, to do the, the standard techniques we, we use to like cool these atoms from room temperature, you know, really hot from an oven down to quantum degeneracy and like turn them into a both Einstein condensate. Great. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the optical lattice potential. What is an optical lattice? Uh, well, you can think about two traveling waves approaching each other. I have a red wave and a blue wave approaching each other. If I look at their sum, I see this black wave. It makes a standing wave. I can do this with lasers. I can point two lasers at each other. And in this region, uh, if you look at the time average electric field intensity, what you get is something standing that looks like this. Uh, and you can make it so that atoms are attracted to the potential minima of the lattice. This is how you make a lattice in one dimension. Um, and you can do this with multiple pairs of beams to make two-dimensional lattices or, or, or three-dimensional lattices. And so we make the optical Kagome lattice by sending in 
one pair of beads, this green set of beads, uh, that approach each other with a relative 120 degree angle in the plane, in the plane of the screen. And we overlap that with another lattice where we've done the same thing, but of a different color. And if you look at the region here in the middle, uh, what you see is a potential energy landscape for the atoms that looks like this. The black points are the points of low kinetic energy, uh, potential energy where the atoms will go. The white parts are where the atoms will be repelled from. So this is our cogmia lattice. Uh, you can see this triangle here, this triangle here, this triangle here. So just like I showed you uh, before, this is a lattice of these vertex connected equilateral triangles. Sorry, maybe I missed it, um, Charles. What was the point of the two different colored lasers? Yeah, that's, I totally glossed over that. This is an important thing. Um, so the overlap of these two different lattices is what actually allows us to get the cogamy lattice. So this, uh, this region here, it, it's, uh, it excludes the atoms. It, it pushes the atoms away and it comes from overlapping these two sets of beams mm -hmm. in a way where um, one of the lattice sites of one of the underlying lattices doesn't allow atoms to be here. So let me say that uh, the red beams here make their own lattice. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, and the green beams make their own lattice. We overlap these two lattices together. And because these two beam, these two uh, lattices are used with two different kinds of laser beams to have a factor of two difference in their wavelength, you generate a lattice pattern that looks like this cognitive lattice. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if they didn't, if the beams didn't have this factor of two difference, you would not generate this cognitive lattice. You wouldn't be able to. Right. Okay. Got it. So here, let me get into our experimental results. Uh, what do we do in this first measurement? Uh, we take a uh, rubidium BC and we shine a laser onto it uh, that is offset from the center of the BC to impart a momentum through dipole force. So we accelerate our BC to some velocity and we uh, then ramp up uh, the lattice, for example. And in doing so, we can load the atoms into different energy bands of the cognitive lattice. Here are uh, measurements that show proof of us being able to do that. Um, here are simulations to compare these measurements to. So what are we looking at? Uh, we're looking at diffraction images of uh, this BC. So BC is wave-like and we can load it into a lattice and shut off the lattice. And what we uh, recover from this process uh, are momentum space pictures of the, the atoms having been in the lattice. So we can learn about the state of the um, the state of the atoms in the lattice in this way. So um, at the ground band in the lowest energy band, where the atoms have zero velocity, we expect after loading the atoms into the lattice and shutting it off, the diffraction image to look like this, this rotationally symmetric picture. And we see something that is qualitatively very, very similar to this when we actually do it in the lab. Um, in this situation where we um, move the atoms to a different uh, different band, uh, we see a different, um, we expect, I guess we, we, we predict a different diffraction image and we see just this. Um, this is the second band, uh, or uh, if we compare what we measure to what we expect for loading into the third band, we see that there's quite a lot of agreement. So. Uh, this is just verification that we can indeed load atoms into uh, different bands, and we can move them around in different bands. Um, now, oh, I, ooh, I actually misspoke. Yes, this was uh, not a second band picture. This is an image of uh, the atoms at a different quasi momentum in the first. Okay. Uh, now, what I want to get to is this idea of the group velocity of the atoms. So the Feynman-Hellman theorem, this sort of general result in, I guess, quantum mechanics, if you will, allows us to 
uh, relate the energy uh, in the lattice directly to uh, this group velocity. And the group velocity is the, essentially the derivative of the band energy. So this expression shows us that the group velocity is the slope of the energy bands that we wanna measure. And it's very easy for us to measure group velocity. So what we do in our experiments are, we take images that look like these and we analyze the center of mass and we count the pixel intensity in the image and it gives us a group velocity. And we know that that group velocity is the local slope of the band at that momentum. And so as a function of momentum in different bands, if we take measurements of this group velocity, we get essentially the derivative of the energy bands. And so if we wanna to start to think about which, bland, which band is flat, then we should look for uh, a third band that has group velocity of zero. That would be a flat band whose derivative is zero. And so here, what we're doing is plotting the group velocity as a function of momentum, uh, in lattice momentum, and the different energy bands here. Uh, band one, band three, and band four, this is the band that should be flat. So what we expect here, ideally, is that uh, this, uh, this group velocity should be zero. Uh, and this is in, this is using a prediction from uh, non-interacting band theory, um, which is this dotted line, or this dashed line here. Uh, however, if you compare our measurements, the blue circles, uh, you see that they are consistent with being non-zero. And if instead of using, uh, if you use an improved theory, uh, based off the gross potassium equation, which is a, an analog of the Schrodinger equation, but you have this extra term that cares about uh, a potential, effective potential generated by atom-atom interactions. So a, potential, so a term in the equation that cares about density. And you try to predict what the group velocity should be in the third band. You see this black solid curve, uh, which at least at this scale agrees much better uh, with our measurements. Okay. And so what we have come across is this idea of band structure renormalization, right? Interactions between the atoms, uh, they restructure the optical lattice itself, providing this self-consistent band structure. Um, I mentioned that, you know, we use the gross potassium equation this Schrodinger-like equation that has this extra term that cares about density, and it's the, the, the density or the atom-atom interaction based off of that density, which adds a sort of additional potential uh, to the atoms that gets added on top of the external uh, Kagome lattice potential that we apply with lasers. And so these atom-atom interactions sort of distort the effective lattice that the atoms see. Okay, so here's a way for us to, to sort of think about what's happening. Uh, this is an image, uh, a simulated image of uh, one lattice site of the Cogma lattice, uh, by one unit cell, excuse me, a unit cell being the sort of smallest object of optical lattice that you can translate around to span the entire lattice. So this is what the unit cell of the Cogma lattice looks like, and it has four different sites one of which is excluded um, uh, in the way that I mentioned earlier when Olivia asked about the, the uh, cognitive lattice uh, picture that I showed. If uh, we look at the population of atoms that are distributed between these different sites, the different sites of this real space lattice, as a function of how uh, deep, I shouldn't say this, too jargony, as a function of uh, how much the atoms are affected by one of the subcomponent lattices, the green lattice that uh, adds to the cognitive lattice, we see that the atoms are redistributed between these different lattice sites. So as we deepen, as we uh, uh, increase the binding from one of the sub lattices, the green one, we see that uh, the population of atoms in site A decreases or the population of atoms in uh, B, the sites B and C increase. And so these are atoms that are being shuffled around the real space lattice. 
Uh, and again, remember that the density of atoms matters. The density of atoms changing means the extra potential that the, la the atoms experience, uh, experience change. So you're so changing Charles, the extra potential. I just want yeah. to make sure <laughs> I understand this before we go forward. So you're plotting this as a function of how much they feel those extra interatomic effects that change the potential. Is that what you were saying when you said when you meant by deep? No, um, uh, maybe indirectly, but so, so again, there are two lattices and I overlap them. Uh, I am changing the, the attraction of uh, the atoms to one of the lattices. I'm making the atoms be, want to be pulled towards potential minima of one of the lattice, one of the lattices more, more and more as, a, uh, as I move to the right in this plot. Okay. And what this is doing is shuffling atoms around. Okay. So and now you're plotting. So the different colors are the different sites, I see. So the different sites, yep. Okay. okay. Yep. And the atom population gets changed as we, in different sites, gets changed as we deform the lattice, basically, to so deform the, the carbon layer. And what's the difference between B and C here? Um, it's like in the image on the left or the right? On the right. Well, I guess the left too. Um, um, it's the, uh, let's see, what is, uh, so, so, you know, every lattice has a unit cell that you use with mm -hmm. a certain number of sites that you have to move around to, uh, to span the lattice. And so the, what this is showing is that the population of atoms uh, becomes sort of equally distributed uh, when you, uh, uh, in the B and C sites. And if you look at this image, this is quite different than the cognitive lattice. This is, this is not the cognitive lattice that you expect. Okay. So it's the, the atoms uh, interacting, making a sort of new potential for the atoms that doesn't look like the cognitive lattice. And so based off of this, you, you perhaps shouldn't expect to see a flat band because this real space lattice that you expect doesn't look like the cognitive lattice. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and so uh, another way to think about how the group velocity, or so the slope of the energy bands, is is changing. Um, here we are plotting the slope of the the third band as a function of the depth of the lattice. Uh, this is one of the one of the component lattices that make the cognitive lattice. Okay. Um, and so we see that if you look at our measurements, the blue dots, and you compare them to your expectation for how the group velocity should change as I deepen the subcomponent lattice, uh, it doesn't agree uh, as well with uh, the non-interacting theory. So atoms have no interactions compared to uh, the theory where we take into consideration the fact that atoms are interacting with each other. Uh, another way we can look, about, look at this, and perhaps this is the, the most direct way to see that this is an important effect, is looking at how the group velocity changes as you change the atom density. So this is, this is like a direct sign. This, this is a direct look at the term in the Gross-Potevsky equation, which changes the potential that the atoms feel. feel. Uh, so we see that if we compare our data, the blue circles, to this theory curve, we do indeed see that the slope of the uh, third band changes as a function of density. So this is, uh, you know, lattices have bands that look a particular way. Changing the structure of a lattice changes the energy bands. If I change the density of the atoms, I'm changing the shape of the energy bands. And this is because in our system, we are, we are moving away from the cognitive lattice by uh, introducing uh, interactions between atoms. Cool, that's awesome. Um, Charles, sorry, clarification for um, somebody in the chat. They just wanted to be reminded of the dotted lines meaning in the plot on the top. Uh, yeah, so, so the, dotted, the dotted lines, uh, they are, predictions of the band energies that don't take into account atom-atom uh, interactions. 
So this is without that extra potential in the Schrodinger equation that cares about the density. Gotcha. All right. Awesome. Okay, um, so yeah, this is a natural time to break before I move on to the second topic and a good time for some questions. Yeah, let me just go to the chat really quick, see if we have any. I've already interrupted you a few times, so. Um, okay, uh, somebody wanted to make sure that they understood the dotted lines in the previous slide as well. Did they have the exact same meaning there between the one with the added potential? Um, here and yeah. Here? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I okay. should have been more clear about this, but yeah. So throughout this whole uh, set of uh, data that's being presented, uh, we compare the non-interacting predictions to the interacting predictions. Non-interacting mm -hmm. being the dashed lines, interacting being the solid one. Right. Okay. Interacting Leaking solid, in non-interacting is the dashed line. Yeah, and and okay. the, in these plots, there's a, this uh, this dashed line doesn't have the same meaning in, in this, but. When you compare these plots or plots like these, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, I think that was the only hang up we had. So I think we're good to move forward for now. Okay, awesome. Uh, so I'm uh, going to switch topics entirely and mention again energy bands of, of a lattice. Uh, I suppressed a couple important things when I first mentioned this in my talk because it wasn't the most relevant thing for the Cognome experiment that I showed you. So uh, as I already mentioned, a uh, solid's band structure describes the allowable energy levels for, again, in the solid material, electrons in the crystal lattice. This determines a lot of their properties, these properties here. Uh, but it's not just the structure of these energy bands in momentum, like what I'm showing here. It's also the case that the geometry and topology of the state space uh, that uh, where the, the states that describe the particles live, it also plays a role in material properties. Uh, the most celebrated of which being topological insulators. Um, okay, so uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, these block wave functions, these size, these describe the particles in the lattice. There's this other uh, very important uh, quantity to think about, a uh, property uh, referred to as the Berry connection, which has this form. Okay, so uh, the this Berry connection is this overlap between uh, some state, some block state, and some, I guess, I, the, the quasi-momentum derivative of some other block state. Okay, this, this, this uh, quantity carries information about the uh, shape the uh, and the different ways that parts of the state space that you use to describe the system are connected to each other. Okay, so let me talk about a specific example that's relevant for, the, uh, for another scientific effort in our group. Uh, and that's the idea of band touching points uh, in lattices. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about band touching hexagonal lattices. Okay, so what's a band touching point? A band touching point is where you have two, pan, two bands that approach each other and they actually touch, which means that there's an energy degeneracy between two different energy bands at some particular in lattice momentum. Okay. Band degeneracy or band touching is caused by symmetry. This is the uh, one of the big points that I want to uh, hit home from this slide. And let's talk about a material that lots of people may have heard of. Uh, graphene. So graphene uh, has a hexagonal lattice or a honeycomb lattice. It has a unit cell that has two sites that are equivalent. And so I can take this picture and I can translate it by two particular lattice vectors. One that sort of points in this direction, the direction of my mouse, and another one that points in this direction. And if I make repeated copies of uh, this image, shifted by one of these lattice vectors in any direction, I can create a, a big honeycomb lattice, a big hexagonal lattice. Okay. Uh, so here is a one-dimensional cut of the energy bands of uh, the hexagonal lattice or the graphene lattice. And I'm just showing uh, two energy bands, uh, one band being associated with one side of the unit cell, another band being associated with another side of the unit cell. 
so, you know, I have this, uh, you imagine that a lattice is sort of like a collection of little uh, harmonic oscillator wells that have the, the geometry of whatever lattice you're talking about. And so there, each little well has the lowest motional, they have a, a, a set of motional states. I'm thinking about the lowest motional states. Um, and so uh, that is the ground, the ground state of motion in these, in these little, uh, these little harmonic potentials. And so when I think about it this way, uh, for each one of these sites in the unit cell, so there's two, I get two bands. Okay. So here are my bands. And if I look at these particular points in quasi-momentum, I see that these two bands touch. The two bands become degenerate here and here. And these are referred to as Dirac points. Um, Dirac points, uh, they persist provided certain symmetries of the lattice exist. Uh, those symmetries are inversion symmetry and time reversal symmetry. So inversion symmetry is where you sort of just switch the coordinates of, uh, of uh, every position in the lattice with a minus sign. If the lattice is the same after you do this transformation, it is inversion symmetric. Um, you also need you also need it to be the case that uh, time reversal symmetry is respected. So in the state that you use to describe your particles, if you can shift T to minus T and nothing changes, then you have this time reversal symmetry. Um, and so no matter the perturbation that you give to the system, so long as you have uh, these two symmetries respected, you will have these direct points where these two different energy bands touch each other, where they become degenerate. Um, let me give an example, a nice comparison um, to see how this uh, symmetry degeneracy connection uh, happens. Uh, there's a material, hexagonal boron nitride, which uh, again, it's some type of hexagonal lattice, but its unit cell looks like this. So there are two sites again in the HBN unit cell, uh, site A and site B, but there are different sites which have, say, uh, an offset in how deep the local potential is there. And so imagine that I take the unit cells that sort of point, like one is pointing here, one is pointing here, and I make a bunch of copies of this unit cell along these lattice vectors. And I do this transformation, R goes to minus R, so just a negative sign, uh, flipping the positions of these things. Uh, what you see is you don't have an inversion symmetric lattice. And so you shouldn't expect Dirac points to exist. And in fact, you don't see them in uh, HBN, right? So uh, you see gaps here. Uh, where there is no degeneracy at these points and these equivalent points in the hexagonal or nitride uh, lattice or material. Okay, um, I also want to uh, note this interesting topological property of uh, lattices that have Dirac points. Uh, and it is this fact. So if you take this Berry connection that I mentioned in the previous slide and you integrated around a closed path in momentum space. For example, uh, if I imagine my two-dimensional, uh, if I imagine a two-dimensional band structure, and I can sort of uh, identify a direct point, say, in the middle of my hand, and I can close the trajectory around that direct point, then the very uh, phase, the integral of this that I get is pi. Right? So, so if you enclose a trajectory around a Dirac point that, um, um, yeah. Let me, just, let me just say that again. If you, if you enclose a, a, a Dirac point with a closed trajectory, you get an evolution of your, the phase of your state independent of how you uh, go around that point. Uh, it only depends on the fact that you went around it and you I came back to where you started. You have a closed path. Right? You get this pi, pi evolution. Okay, and there are uh, a couple, there, there are a number of experiments that have been studying direct points in, in literature. I wanted to point out two in particular. Uh, one does something similar to what we do. At least they make a hexagonal lattice in the same way we do. Uh, 
Uh, that is what's being shown here in this image. They shine uh, a, a set of three lasers at each other in the similar to the way that I described the cogmere lattice being formed, and they form uh, this hexagonal lattice. And in this experiment, what they're doing is they make a BEC, a Bose-Einstein condensate, that has two different spin components, uh, two opposite spin components. And they apply a spin-dependent um, force to the atoms, which is being depicted here. So they start with their um, BEC, their two spin component BEC, and they apply a spin dependent force that sends the up the upspins and the downspins in different directions. That's what's being shown in this image here. They can uh, allow these different spin components to evolve in some time in their different directions in momentum space. And then they can apply a series of pulses to uh, make these two spin components uh, uh, approach each other again until they overlap here. And so over this trajectory, they've enclosed some area and uh, they can extract a, a phase associated uh, with the, the area uh, of this loop, I guess you call it a loop. And they can monitor how uh, the phase, uh, which is encoded in, in I guess, the, the, the population of um, first band or second band atoms in this hexagon lattice. They can, they can uh, uh, learn about the phase evolution of the band population um, as a function of the area and whether or not it encloses this point here, which is the direct point. And that's what this plot is here. So they're measuring uh, as a function of momentum, uh, this phase that I mentioned, and they see that once they get to this point here, labeled as K, this is the direct point, they see a pi phase flip. Right? So this is um, this is a verification or, um, you know, yeah, experimental evidence of this pi phase evolution that you get from this topological aspect of the states that you're looking at. Now this is this was done with some uh, with the BC, as I mentioned. Here's another experiment done with instead of a BEC, a fermion analog, uh, a degenerate Fermi gas. Um, and uh, in this experiment, they study it in a checkerboard lattice, um, which, uh, you know, it's, it's not a hexagon lattice, that's okay. It has a different set of uh, symmetries, uh, but it still has a Dirac point. And so in this experiment, they take their gas, they move it in momentum space for their, their quantum degenerate uh, from a gas, they move it in momentum space through a Dirac point, and they monitor what happens. In this experiment, they have the ability to uh, change the potential depth uh, at each one of the sites of the unit cell um, of their lattice. So remember, I mentioned that uh, in the graphene lattice, the two sites of the unit cell are equally deep. In the boron nitride last, there is a depth asymmetry. Okay. And they can they have experimental control over this depth asymmetry, and they control it with this detuning delta. Okay. Um, what they're looking at here is a plot of the transferred population from the lowest band, from the first band to the second band of the uh, honeycomb lattice. Uh, as they move it through uh, a Dirac point uh, that exists or doesn't, depending on if they balance the site asymmetry between the two unit cells. So you see this large transfer population of atoms from the first or second band uh, in the case where they set this to tuning such that they have a graphene lattice, which does have a Dirac point. And as you uh, change this to tuning away from this associated max value, you create a uh, asymmetry in the depth. And so you uh, move away from, uh, yeah, you, you remove inversion symmetry. And so you eliminate the, the Dirac point. And so you don't see this uh, interesting effect of having band population invert 
as you cross the direct point or seeing a pi, an associated pi phase flip um, when you move to the direct point. Okay, so people have been studying this and um, it's certainly uh, an interesting way to learn about the topological nature of the bands that we uh, use to describe properties of our cold atom systems and hopefully use to learn about solid state systems. Okay, um, so again, uh, to make an optical lattice, we overlap some beams. We only need one pair or one set of beams here, three beams with this relative 120 degree uh, angle of incidence. And if you look at the, and if you look at the potential associated with the, with the intensity at this overlap, what you see are a series of potential minima that I've marked with these green dots. Right? So this is my hexagonal lattice. Uh, this is one of my unit cells that I'm circling with my mouse. And this lattice has these unit vectors, uh, A23, A12. And so if I take this unit cell and I translate it here or here or here, you can see that I can generate this whole lattice by just moving this image around. Um, now, and actually, before I, before I let any, anybody see this, uh, you know, we have uh, been developing a way to uh, explore in two dimensions the momentum space that we have access to in the lattice. And I'm happy to talk about some details of that maybe after the talk, um, but I'm going to, I guess I'll introduce it a little bit. But uh, what I'm about to show in a couple of slides are measurements where we use a new technique in our lab where we can create a lattice and then we can move it in, uh, in arbitrary directions in a two-dimensional plane, which allows us to, uh, at least in the lattice frame of the atoms, uh, no, in the lattice frame, uh, it allows us to initialize some state uh, of atoms in the lattice to some arbitrary quasi-momentum. Um, yeah, anywhere in the two-dimensional momentum space that we have access to. Okay. Um, and so this is a bit in the weeds, but I wanted to talk about how we do this. This is, at least what's on the right is, a, is an important point, and I need to show you something about how we do this on the left. So we can move around the lattice by uh, creating a frequency detuning between one of the pairs of beams that we used to make it. If we create a frequency detuning between one of the pairs of beams, uh, then you can make the lattice move along that lattice vector. So along one of the uh, the vectors, uh, A23 that I mentioned, or A12. Okay. In order to do that, we have some control voltage that we can apply that allows us to create a frequency difference between two lasers. So we can use it to make a lattice start moving in one direction. Um, and we have these uh, parameters uh, Q1 and Q2, it doesn't really matter what they are so much, but what they allow is for us to have active feedback control over the positioning of the lattice while we are moving it. And this is an important point for what we hope to do with the cognitive lattice. So we, uh, in normal experiments where we're not translating the lattice, we have feedback control that allows us to keep the lattice in position so that it's not shaking around. Because we don't want to, uh, we want to be able to not have the atoms you know decohere from their states because the lattice is shaking um and this requirement or um which becomes more difficult with the cognitive lattice that is sensitive to relative displacement of the two sub lattices especially if you're going to try to move that combined cognitive lattice around which is what we hope to do in the future so here i just want to come across that we have some experimental tools that allow us to have active feedback control of a lattice that translate that translates uh, not along just one direction, but if we implement a sort of experimental sequence for our uh, laser beam control for both pairs of beams, the one, two, and the two, three pair, then we can uh, create a lattice velocity that looks like this, that has two parts, one of which the, that the, depends on the frequency offset between uh, the beam pair one and two, multiplied by that lattice vector plus uh, the frequency offset between beam two and three multiplied by the associated lattice vector. All right, this is the velocity of our lattice that we can control 
uh, with some set of uh, voltages uh, in, in uh, detailed aspects of our feedback. But what that allows us to do is to give the atoms in the lattice frame some quasi-momentum Q that's equal to minus the single particle mass times this lattice velocity. So this image is an image of our momentum space. Uh, it's kind of a busy image. Let me say a little bit about it. Uh, this is a two-dimensional momentum space. This uh, vector Q is the uh, quasi-momentum of the atoms in the lattice that we can initialize with our feedback system, with our lattice control system. And we can uh, give it different momentum by changing the angle or the length of this Q relative to, uh, say, this uh, horizontal line that goes through this black point, which is zero momentum. Okay. Uh, there are also different uh, Brillouin zones, and I didn't say what Brillouin zones are, but they have to do with the periodic nature of the, the wave functions in the lattice. It has to do with the, the periodicity of the block wave functions. Hey, Charles, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm picking up a lot of interference all of a sudden from your computer. It's from my computer. I think so, because I've been on mute. Um, I hear, like, something buzzing in the background, but... Okay, maybe it's gone now? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, there are these different Brillouin zones. Uh, this is the first Brillouin zone. The blue triangle is the second Brillouin zone. The third, the green is third Brillouin zone. The purple is the fourth Brillouin zone. And just a way for us to, oh, I do hear that. Hmm. Do you have any uh, headphones nearby? It might fix it really quick. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. No, thank, thanks for pointing it out to me. I was kind of in the zone and didn't, didn't notice it. <laughs> Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, it's much better now. Okay, go ahead. Awesome, awesome. Okay. I'll say this is just a nice and convenient way for us to uh, graphically uh, understand what the momentum of the atoms in the lattice look like in this two-dimensional space that we have access to. Okay. Uh, so we want to see if our lattice translation works. Uh, and uh, let me just get to the point and say that it does. It works quite well. Uh, and so what we're doing to verify that is we move the uh, lattice in some direction, which gives the atom some quasi momentum in the lattice. Uh, in this set of experiments that I'm showing, I'm moving the atoms in momentum space, their, their quasi momentum from uh, what we call gamma, this is zero momentum, towards this point, which is the Dirac point, right? So they're moving in this direction, but uh, in, this, in these measurements, I'm changing the length of this vector Q. So in this image, uh, I'm just looking at zero momentum. So I uh, put my BEC there, I turn on the lattice, and I turn it off. This is the image that I see. And this is what we expect from theory. In this image, I've translated the atom's quasi momentum uh, two thirds of the way between zero momentum and the Dirac point. So somewhere around here, this is the diffraction image that we expect to see. Uh, and this is what we see. Uh, here, I've done a similar uh, experiment, but I moved the, uh, the quasi-momentum of the atoms from zero momentum through the Dirac point. This is the Dirac, the, this is the, um, the diffraction picture that we see. And this is what we expect. So these seem to uh, agree very well, and we are confident that the lattice translation works pretty well. And so we should have access to being able to send the quasi momentum of the atoms anywhere in this two dimensional structure. I only have two more slides, uh, two more contentful slides. I know I'm about an hour already. Um, and this is just a little bit of lead up to get to one data set that is uh, very new and we're very excited about. And this is all very preliminary, I'll say. Um, but it's helpful to think about the tight binding model um, in this lattice. So I can write down a very long Hamiltonian that describes in position space the, the system that I'm looking at, these atoms. Uh, but it's useful to just look at for really deep lattice, a very 
a very strongly confining lattice that has this geometry. Uh, it's useful for me to look at the Hamiltonian in a basis described by the two bands, the two lowest bands uh, of the lattice. And that's what I've done here. So this Hamiltonian can be described by uh, some uh, hopping amplitude, uh, J. Uh, it tells you about the hopping rate between sites, it's about the kinetic energy of the atoms, and the tight binding model. You're only considering atoms hopping um, to the next site over. Uh, we consider hopping two sites away to be negligible. That, that's what makes the tight binding model. And when you do this process, you uh, can write this Hamiltonian as this two-dimensional matrix with these uh, delta Ks. It doesn't matter so much what they look like. They're, they're sort of uh, some complicated looking sinusoids. But if you tailor expand these expressions um, about the Dirac point, this point in momentum space that we call K, uh, and you look at uh, the energy bands as uh, a function of uh, Q, uh, small momentum deviations away from K, away from your Taylor expanded point. What you see are energy bands that look like this, right? So uh, this is the this is the Dirac point where the lower energy band and the upper energy band become degenerate, and they have this linear crossing. Right? This is our Dirac point. Uh, you can also rewrite this Hamiltonian in this form, um, where this vector Q, this is your quasi momentum vector, is dotted with um, uh, these are poly matrices. And what this looks like is a Hamiltonian for a spin. In our case, it's a pseudo spin, up and down being band population states, lower band or upper band, uh, in a transverse magnetic field B. And so um, this, this, this creates an interesting opportunity to uh, send the atoms into some, uh, along some trajectory and quasi momentum, uh, say to the Dirac point K, and then move it off at some angle and see what happens as a function of angle. Knowing that as I go along, say this path, I have my atoms in the lower band. And as I turn away from K at some point, I see, uh, I, I get the, the effect of this transverse magnetic field which will give me some combination of population in the first and second band. So for example, you might expect to uh, go along this path from say zero momentum over to K and turn right. And now I have effectively a spin down uh, with a, a field, a transverse field that puts my system into a superposition of up and down. Okay. Um, here's a picture of my Brillouin zone. So this is my, my quasi momentum space, my momentum space. Uh, and so I'm going from zero momentum over to the rack point and I turn at some angle theta. These are actual measurements of us doing that where we use this technique called band mapping to turn uh, images of our atoms after they come out of the lattice uh, into relative populations in different bands. So if we carefully turn off the lattice, we can map different velocity components of the atoms onto a corresponding energy band. And we can do that by thinking very carefully about how to overlay these hexagons on top of images of the atoms when we do this band mapping process. So here I'm looking at band mapping pictures as a function of this angle theta where I parameterize it with this n. So uh, this is at angle pi over six. This is at angle pi over six plus pi over four, et cetera. Right? So I'm measuring band population as a function of this angle around the K point. And what I see is this band population plot here. So the, the sort of cartoon image I gave of approaching the K point and turning at some angle, uh, projecting onto some, uh, some creating the superposition and then projecting onto uh, one of the bands is exactly what we see. Uh, this, uh, this state being some linear combination, the state that we see being some linear combination of uh, 
atoms in the first band, atoms in the second band. And so in our band population measure, measurements as a function of theta, we see that uh, band two, uh, the population, which uh, goes like the square of, uh, oh, sorry, this term, so sine squared of theta over two, it looks just like that. And the band population uh, in energy band one looks like cosine squared over two. Um, okay. Um, and so this is an interesting fa effect of singularity of the wave function at the Dirac point. Uh, we have, you know, in, in this process, we wrap around the Dirac point, we uh, have this pi barrier curvature, but the interesting singularity that we see is as you approach the, the Dirac point, and it doesn't matter how fast you do so, as soon as you cross the Dirac point, you have this inversion of population from band one to band two. Okay. That's all I wanted to say about this. Let me, uh, let me wrap this up right now. Uh, thank you for the extra time I've taken. I appreciate it. Uh, so to summarize our Kagame experiment, we place atoms into the interesting flat band where we expect to see frustration in the Kagame lattice. Uh, I want to point you to this paper here uh, that came out last year. Um, if you want to read more about this work that we've done. Okay. Uh, one thing that we've seen is uh, that the atoms in the flat band are unstable in some way. They only last for a few hundreds of microseconds. And so uh, what we don't have right now, or at least what we didn't have it uh, in that paper was a confinement in the third direction, right? So I talked about a two-dimensional lattice. I can add confinement along this direction. And we suspect that that might add some lifetime to the atoms in the flat band and uh, might be able to help us answer some other questions we have. And generally, because uh, interactions deform the band structure, there's this whole nonlinear band structure to think about um, that, it, you know, in these cold atom systems hasn't been explored fully. And so there's lots of interesting uh, directions to point in regarding a nonlinear band structure and their effects. Um, regarding the Dirac point experiment, um, as I mentioned, we put the BC in a honeycomb lattice. We use this new technique we have in the lab of arbitrary lattice translation to move the atoms through momentum space. Uh, and what we find is as we uh, go around this Dirac point, we see a band population between the first and second band that maps onto this model of a pseudo spin one half and a transverse magnetic field. Uh, some questions uh, that we have are, if you look at the band population between one and two, they're almost 100%. Uh, but they're not quite, we're sort of missing a few percent of atoms. And the question is, does this have something to do with adiabaticity of our translation? Right? We move the atoms through momentum space towards uh, the rack point where the band gap is decreasing. And so we have to be careful about time scales because if we ramp too fast compared to the band gap, you might expect to artificially get population inversion from the first man to the second man. That is not a topological effect, but a non-adiabaticity effect. And we also sort of wonder how, how is this picture changed by interactions? Um, I'm going to ignore this point for right now, but we're also interested in using the Kagame lattice, for example, to study quadratic touching points, which you can describe in this pseudo magnetic field picture, but the nature of the singularity versus the, the Berry curvature that you would measure going around the singularity, it's different and very interesting. Okay, so I am finished now. Thank you so much for letting me go over a bit. I'm open to have some questions. Yeah, no problem. Thanks again, Charles. That was really a really interesting talk. Um, we do have at least one question that I didn't get to throughout the talk. So um, somebody asked, could you please comment on the fact that you get ellipse-shaped structures in the data when we see circles in the simulation in the diffraction pictures? So I'm not exactly sure what slide that was. I think we have to go back quite a bit. Um, was it in the direct point part or the beach or the Kagame part? Um, I think it was in the later half. The later half. Ellipse shaped features. I wonder if they're talking about this. I think maybe here. Yeah, they look like they're yeah. maybe a little bit more spread out than like the theory would predict. So I think they just want to know what effects would cause that. Yeah, so um, 
That's a good question. You know, we certainly see from, from uh, okay, so let me say, it takes 40 seconds to run one of these experiments. So uh, from having a, a gas of atoms at say 200 Celsius to a BC in the lattice, uh, wrapping up the lattice and shutting it off, it takes 40 seconds to generate an image like this. And so we run these experiments back to back to back. And when we, as we look at experimental shot to shot, uh, there are fluctuations in the, uh, in the system that cause sort of shot to shot variations, say in the atom number in the BC that we have to be careful to control, or even, um, or even, you know, fluctuations in the beams that control the lattice, right? So I have these beams coming in, they overlap to make a lattice. and if there's some fluctuation in say the position, then the overlap between the beams that make the lattice is a little different. Maybe it destroys lattice geometry a little bit. Um, maybe the lattice looks tilted or curved in some weird way. Um, maybe when I load the BEC into the lattice in the first place, I, you know, I the the trap that we used to make the BC was shaking, uh, allows the BC to shake a little bit. And so I I load the BEC into the lattice with some uncertainty and momentum. I mean, all these effects can make for sort of strange images that, that look like this. All right, awesome. Yeah, I think, you know, it looks very similar to the theory, but obviously when you do experimental work, nothing is perfect for yes. a million yeah. reasons. Oh yeah, and, and in, in BEC lattice experiments, there are really a million reasons. Sure. So um, in the interest of time, I wanted to ask one more question. Okay. And um, this, this is sort of a vague question, so bear with me for a minute. Um, I think, you know, obviously a lot of this work is really interesting. It's very different than the type of work that I'm, that I'm used to and that I've studied. So if you could get into the lab like tomorrow and do the next experiment that you like sort of have in the back of your head in like 24 hours, what would it be? And what would you be looking for and what would that imply? Like if you could just do your next experiment in like no time at all, what mm -hmm. would happen? And what would that imply about, you know, the results in the future of this field in particular? Yeah, so uh, let's see. Maybe I'll answer it about the Kagame experiment and for the, the rack point experiment. Yeah, that would be perfect. For the Kagame experiment, uh, I might look for this sort of exotic superfluid state. So there's a, there's, a, there's a state that people refer to as a trion superfluid. Um, um, and what's the interesting property to know? Well, one, people haven't been able to see it. Uh, it's a superfluid that uh, condenses not at, like it's, uh, when you create the superfluid, its lowest energy state is not at zero momentum, that gamma point but it's actually at, at K. Uh, and if you're able to do band mapping images, you'd see an uh, interesting distribution uh, there. And I think it'd be super interesting to, to do. Uh, senior grad student that I work with, I've worked with who's now a postdoc, uh, has been really interested in this a long time. And he's convinced me this is a very interesting thing. And I certainly agree. So seeing this uh, elusive trying superfluid state would be really cool for the Kagame experiment which would the cognitive lattice being particularly useful to like generate this, this state. Uh, as far as the, the Dirac point experiment goes, it will be studying this quadratic point, the quadratic touching point between bands. So in these, in these points where you have some interesting topological effects, say the uh, Dirac point where you see a pi, of pi evolution or what you might call a topological charge of one, you go around this point in parameter space uh, and you see evidence of a phase change in your system. At a quadratic touching point, the topological, topological charge is two. So you go around the point and that phase change is two pi. So you actually wouldn't be able to detect that there's some interesting topological thing that's happened there. But I guess if you, if you go from, if you go through that quadratic touching point and turn at some angle, you will immediately see that there's something, at least in this two band picture where you can swap population between these two levels, you'll immediately see that there's some interesting uh, effect having to go with trajectories that include this particular point. Um, and so maybe there's some 
way to see the effect of these almost hidden singularities um, in the state space that describes your system. That would be the things I would do. Okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, I guess in the interest of time, we should wrap up here, but you know, I really wanna thank you again for taking the time to come and talk to us today. I think that was a super interesting presentation. So uh, yeah, if you have any last words or any advice for our listeners, I'll let you chime in here. Um, no, I don't know if I have any advice. Uh, certainly thanks again just put you on the for spot listening just and thanks for inviting me. Uh, stay, stay interested in the cold atom world. I, I you know, I'm, I'm not pre presenting on uh, superconducting qubits and things right now, but there's some interesting quantum computing type things coming along the pipes of neutral atoms, uh, like neutral yeah, atoms for, sure. here. for example, sure. people like we're really, really interested in like Rydberg atoms and tweezer arrays for quantum computing. So they're a thing. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. Definitely. No, I mean, there is more to quantum besides superconducting qubits. That's absolutely true. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks again, Charles. So I'm just going to wrap things up here. This has been the Kiss Kit seminar series that we have every Friday at noon. If you haven't liked and subscribed yet, please do so. And we'll see you next week. Thanks again so much for tuning in. Thanks.